On this special edition of News Vision, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of Everglades National Park, a World Heritage Site, a Biosphere Reserve, and a Wetlands of International Importance. The Everglades is a super unique ecosystem. It is the only ecosystem like it in the entire world. We bring you team coverage from the field, from examining the long, rich history of the Everglades and its vital significance to Florida. A lot of Floridians make a living out of this. To why the wetlands were nearly obliterated in the 20th century. You know, it's this place that we essentially, you know, destroyed half of it and we've crippled the other half. We take a closer look at the massive efforts to restore and preserve the Everglades. This is the most expensive ecosystem restoration project in the entire world, but it's worth it. Plus, we uncover the secrets of the swamp from endangered and invasive species to some unique sites off the beaten path. We want to protect the Everglades and we want to make people aware of the Everglades. And we look ahead at what the future of this one-of-a-kind ecosystem holds. The Everglades is a test. If we pass, we may get to keep the planet. Hello and welcome to this special edition of UMTV's News Vision from one of the most fascinating and important places in the world, the Florida Everglades. I'm Sophia Vitello. And I'm Daryl Barnes. Thank you for joining us. The Everglades National Park was inaugurated in December 1947 and all throughout 2023, it's celebrating its 75th anniversary. And what you see around us is called the Anhinga Trail, one of the most popular trails in the park. And it's also part of the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. Yeah, and we at the University of Miami are very fortunate to live close to this ecosystem that's truly one of a kind. And we're here today to introduce you to it from its rich history to the numerous benefits it provides for millions of people to the serious challenges it's faced with and the gigantic efforts to restore and preserve it. The Everglades National Park is only 75 years old, but the wetlands that you see here have been around for at least 5,000 years. Before it was the place to go for airboat tours and seeing wild gators, well before becoming the largest environmental restoration project in history, this was the Everglades. A massive unmarked piece of land that early explorers called uninhabitable. When the first Spanish came in the 16th century, they immediately told the king that it was liable to overflow and of no use. It was swampland. The swamp. That's the title of the book Grunwald wrote in 2007 about the Everglades. It's a title that represents the negative attitude people initially had towards the area. But in fact, this place is an environmental treasure. The Everglades is a super unique ecosystem. It is the only ecosystem like it in the entire world. Home to thousands of native plant and animal species, the Everglades are 7,800 square miles of wetlands, where water slowly flows from the Kissimmee River near Orlando all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. There is some evidence of prehistoric people living in the Everglades some 15,000 years ago, when the area was an arid landscape. The Calusa, the Tequesta, the Seminole, and the Mikosuke were the only humans who lived in the Everglades for hundreds of years, up until the 19th century. These natives called the land Pehayoku, which means grassy water. White explorers went through a few names on their maps, but settled on the phrase Everglades. Glades after the tall sawgrass that grows in the shallow water and ever, because it looked like that grassy water went on forever. Throughout the colonialism era, the Spanish Empire claimed this land in what they called East Florida, but they never actually lived there. So with no use for it, Spain gave up its claims to Florida in 1821, leaving it to the growing United States. And when Americans started moving in, they realized something. The land underneath the shallow water was extremely fertile, and if they got rid of the water, they could use it to grow crops. This was the age of manifest destiny when Americans believed that we were kind of destined to tame the wilderness and turn it into something amazing for all mankind. And the Everglades was the wilderness. 
In 1909, Americans began draining the Everglades, creating a land boom, and pushing out the natives so they could farm crops like sugarcane. And with business booming and all this new cheap land, Florida became a hot spot for developers. This has been a place that was settled by dreamers and schemers and people who wanted to make a quick buck. Developers like Henry Flagler came to the outskirts of the Everglades, creating metropolitan cities like Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. And as the population grew, the fresh water from the Everglades became the perfect water supply. To these American settlers, everything was great. Until the population got too big. People like activist Marjorie Stoneman Douglas started realizing all the development had been disrupting the ecosystem all along and was now threatening endangered species and the new city's water supply. She recognized that it was a river of grass. It wasn't just water sitting there and sawgrass that happened to be inside the water, that it was an entire ecosystem that worked together. But the famous writer wasn't working alone. One gentleman who worked tirelessly in the early days to establish the park was Ernest Coe. In 1928, activists like Ernest Coe came together with a plan to protect the Everglades. Coe wrote a letter to the government proposing for the Everglades to be named a national park. And after years of efforts, Congress bought in, partially. Lawmakers passed legislation to establish a national park in the Everglades, but it didn't protect the entire area. On December 6th, 1947, this section of the Everglades officially became a national park. But people kept trying to control and divert the flow of water in the Everglades by building close to 2,000 miles of canals and levees along with 16 major water pumping stations. And those changes continued to negatively affect the ecosystem, to the point where half of it was gone and the other half was left damaged. It is a place that was significantly altered and impacted by human activity. And that's why we're working to restore it nowadays. Restoration efforts began in the 1970s after Congress declared that the federal government is responsible for protecting endangered and threatened species and critical habitat. And for more than half a century now, humans have been trying to undo the damage they've done to the Florida Everglades. As you can see, the Everglades is not like any other national park in the United States. It doesn't have geysers and hot springs like Yellowstone, or towering granite monoliths and waterfalls like Yosemite, or breathtaking canyons like Zion. In fact, the Everglades was the first national park that was officially recognized for its biodiversity, not just its scenery. Maddie Basalg joins us now to tell us more about the ecosystem's significance and some of its numerous benefits. Maddie. It's a common belief that if the Everglades were to be destroyed, that would negatively affect not only Florida, but the rest of the world. This ecosystem is extremely important, both economically and ecologically. The wetlands act as a natural filtration system, supplying drinking water to millions of Floridians. The area also retains and controls floodwaters, irrigates much of the state's agriculture, and provides a habitat for thousands of animal and plant species. And every year, more than one million people from all over the world visit the Everglades. It's heaven to me. We, we absolutely love it and we come out here and try to hike and, and see all the wildlife. It's the only place in the world like it. Visitors come to find solitude and comfort, marvel at the park's serene beauty, and see plants and animals that exist only in this ecosystem. The Everglades it has a way to speak to each one of us uh, individually. For me, it is not only a place to, to come and recreate, uh, but it's, it's a place of wonder. It's this amazing freshwater ecosystem that flows all the way from Lake Okeechobee and all the way down to Florida Bay and the 10,000 islands at the tip. But the Everglades is a lot more than just a beautiful spot to visit. Without these wetlands, life in Florida would not be possible. Our livelihood down here depends on a healthy Everglades. There's just no question about it. It provides drinking water for the more than 8 million people that live in South Florida. In addition to providing drinking water to millions of people, the Everglades irrigates much of the state's agriculture. The Everglades Agricultural Area, also known as the EAA, is one of the largest and most important in the United States. The EAA is the country's largest supplier of fruits, vegetables, and sugarcane. Florida has a, a very 
a long story of agriculture. It is a, a great place to grow things. Another benefit that the Everglades provides is protection against hurricanes. The coastal marshes and mangroves of the Everglades often act as a buffer that helps protect the residents from high winds, storm surge, and rising sea levels. The Everglades touches basically everything, environmentally speaking, in the state of Florida, whether we recognize it or not, from you know our forested watersheds in the northern part of the state to our southern estuaries, the Everglades is inextricably connected. And it's not just people who benefit from the Everglades. It is internationally renowned as one of the most biodiverse communities on the planet, home to a wide variety of plant and animal species, some of whom can't be found anywhere else in the world. You've got 69 endangered species. You know, you've got panthers and gators and otters and this incredible profusion of wading birds. You've got snail kites and paraphyte and just you know, it's this incredible just potpourri. And not only is it a place that protects wildlife, but it is also home to the Miccosukee and Seminole Native American tribes. This place is a place that protected them back in the 1800s when our own government was persecuting them, trying to find them, to send them to faraway places or worse. But it is our duty to remind ourselves who was here first and who truly calls this place home. The Everglades and its water supply are also crucial to Florida's economic growth. It, it provides for our tourism-based economy here in South Florida. It has benefits to our real estate values, as well as boating, fishing, hunting, all those uh, recreational things that we like to do in it. The importance of the Everglades and its benefits to life in South Florida are indisputable. Without the Everglades, the region would likely not exist. For UMTV, I'm Maddie Basalik. Many people refer to the Everglades as a swamp and are surprised to discover that the water you see behind me is actually fresh water. And this water is the most significant and the most abused resource that holds this ecosystem together. Caitlin Kacharski is here with some of the threats facing the fresh water of the Everglades. Caitlin. Guys, take a look at this. Around this time of year, the water level should be up to my knees. But right now, it is barely up to my ankles, leaving many to ask, where has all the water gone? I explored some threats to the Everglade fresh water and what this could mean for millions of Florida residents. When close to 9 million Florida residents turn on their tap, their fresh water may come from the home of gators. Uh, one out of every four Floridians, and I'm not just talking South Floridians, drinks water from the Everglades. But this freshwater source has been under serious threat since the 1800s when efforts to drain the Everglades began. We started filling the canal or, or, or creating canals in order to drain the water from the wetlands that need the water in order to be healthy. As a result of the draining efforts, 75% of the Everglades historic water flow has been lost. They thought it was this you know, inhospitable, godforsaken, pestilential, you know, mosquito-infested swamp. You know, draining it was seen as the kind of great service to humanity. Um, people didn't think like, oh no, that might get rid of the Everglades. Water pollution is also a growing issue, and much of the pollution has come from Florida's growing agricultural economy, which takes place on drained land within the Everglades. There are more than 400,000 acres of sugarcane alone, in addition to millions of acres of other crops planted where the Everglades used to be. There's been a lot of development for agricultural interests in um, the Everglades agricultural area and not so great agricultural practices for controlling runoff and pollution for things like nitrogen and phosphorus that come from fertilizers. Um, what made it the Everglades was this pristine water quality where it was literally cleaner than Evian. It was this oligotropic ecosystem that was defined by its lack of phosphorus. The agricultural industry releases too much phosphorus in the Everglades, and algae feed off this now abundant nutrient. All these algal um, species are trying to accumulate those nutrients and then they become uh, unchecked in their, in their growth. So this algal biomass will kill everything else. The overgrowth of algae depletes oxygen, killing fish and other animals. But it's not just fertilizer that is polluting the water. 
human waste is also contributing. We have a lot of septic tanks in Miami-Dade County, over 120,000 septic tanks that are regularly inundated with water. But septic tanks need about two feet of dry ground beneath it. And if they don't have that two feet of dry ground, it's then infiltrating our groundwater. And now, the long-time impacts of climate change are also challenging our water supply. With sea level rise, salt water is moving into the Everglades and contaminating the fresh water. Historically, very important and uh, very productive freshwater, saltwater areas that are now becoming more and more almost exclusive saltwater areas. And the salt water is also pushing further inland, taking the place of freshwater that is drained from the aquifer. During certain parts of the year, um, different areas of the Everglades require different volumes of water deliveries. So we can't just like pump a bunch of water into the Everglades when it used to be historically dry. And as fresh water is pumped in the wrong directions, salt water takes its place. Climate change has also led to irregular weather patterns, which can cause droughts that fail to fill up our tap. And with more people moving to Florida, the fresh water crisis will only continue and our Everglades tap may run dry. But while this freshwater source may be under threat, not all hope is lost. Scientists have been working for years on water restoration. Why Culpman traveled to central Florida to learn what can be done to restore the historic water flow of the Everglades. Wyatt, what did you find? Thanks, Caitlin. Restoring the historic water flow in the Everglades has been the most important task in front of government officials and scientists for many decades here in Florida. And I had a chance to take a closer look at one project that has cost billions of dollars to clean and retain the fresh water near Lake Okeechobee, the largest reservoir in the Everglades. The Everglades begins at Lake Okeechobee in central Florida, or at least it used to. For centuries, the water flow worked flawlessly. Historically, Lake Okeechobee and its natural flow used to operate sort of as a saucer. So in the headwaters of the Kissimmee River, during the rainy season, Lake Okeechobee would fill up and eventually spill over the southern edge of the lake and create a sheet flow effect down into the southern Everglades. And when water in the lake was low, the flow would stop and allow the Everglades to dry seasonally. But all that changed when people started draining the Everglades and building dams around Lake Okeechobee. There wasn't this understanding that this ecosystem was all connected, um, that you couldn't just put a fence around part of it. The drastic changes to the ecosystem led to serious problems with the flow, conservation, and management of freshwater. Right now, we have this completely messed up ecosystem where in the wet season, there's way too much water and no place to put it. Currently, we dump billions of gallons of water each year from Lake Okeechobee to get rid of it because we don't have the capacity to put it back in the environment where it used to go historically. So over the past few decades, scientists and environmentalists have been working on multiple projects to try to restore the historic flow of water in the Everglades. And arguably the most important of these initiatives is the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir that encompasses almost 17,000 acres. This project is widely regarded as the crown jewel of Everglades restoration, and it creates a deep sort of storage reservoir with a lot of storage capacity that will allow us to clean up water before sending it south. This reservoir is critical because it'll provide the biggest benefit to all different areas of the Everglades ecosystem. Before, the only way we could get rid of it, again, was sending it out east and west, and that was not good because it, it didn't allow us a chance to clean the water before it was sent out to tide. The reservoir will be one of the most important assets to keeping polluted water away from Florida's coastlines and not far from here at Lake Okeechobee. And by 2030, the $4 billion project will be able to hold at least 80 billion gallons of water and make sure that water is clean many miles before it even gets to the Everglades. And while the reservoir itself might not be the ultimate solution to many water problems in the Everglades, it certainly is a big step in the right direction. It's hard to replicate what Mother Nature created initially. And so we're doing our best, um, but we know that even if we meet, you know, just a percentage of what we had historically, we'll see those really measurable benefits to the ecosystems. For UMTV, I'm Wyatt Kopelman. And that project you just heard about is one of the many initiatives to restore the Everglades. You see, in the 1900s, America nearly destroyed this vast habitat that you see behind us. And it wasn't until the end of last century that environmental groups and the federal government stepped in to undo the damage and save this place. 
Melanie Lowe is here to tell us what has been done to bring the River of Grass back from the brink of death. Melanie? It's hard to imagine it now that we know how important water is to the Everglades. But about a century ago, officials deemed this ecosystem worthless because of its water. And they came up with various plans to drain it in an effort to use the vast land for agriculture and as a place for people to live. They tried this for decades and in the process managed to destroy almost half of the Everglades and left the other half an ecological mess. And it was not until the last third of the 20th century when people realized the enormous harm that they had caused to the wetlands. And that led to the biggest and most comprehensive restoration project in the world. You know, we've had this abusive relationship with our natural surroundings and the Everglades, you know, it's this place that we essentially, you know, destroyed half of it and we've crippled the other half. We have caused a lot of damage to it over time and that was due to development interests, it was due to uh, a number of different political factors back in the day. Once people realized the huge damage they had done to the ecosystem, they launched an equally huge effort to try to restore it. And now we're doing the largest environmental restoration project in the history of the planet. The Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, is legislation that was passed in the year 2000 to repair the damaged Everglades over the course of 30 years. What it does is it sets forth a framework for how we are going to undo the damage that we've done to the Everglades when we drain the swamp. This level of restoration effort has never been tried anywhere else in the world. The plan includes more than 60 individual initiatives aimed at restoring, protecting, and preserving the historic water flow that was disrupted. This vast environmental undertaking is critical to the area's biodiversity, flood control, and fresh water supply. Everglades restoration is about water conservation. It's about rehydrating the Everglades and providing for the needs of all our coastal waters. Ensuring the right quantity and quality of water is making its way all the way down to Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. But many think restoring the historic flow is simply impossible. We've developed in places where flow used to be, and now as a result, we cannot restore in those areas. But the project has faced a lot of tough challenges that are expected to delay its implementation, especially over the past year. We had Hurricane Ian, which decimated the west coast of Florida in very serious ways. And when we have situations like that, they're unpredictable, and we have to pivot and we have to adjust. The comprehensive Everglades restoration plan is not only the largest in the world, but also the most expensive one. Initially projected to cost about $8 billion, it has now more than doubled in cost. We're spending $20 billion, and that's not Park Service money or your money. This is the American people's money. Many experts think it's worth it. We know that Everglades restoration is our best defense to rising seas and storm surge and climate change impacts. So we're talking about a system that is absolutely essential to restore. And it is one of the few projects that has received unequivocal support from all political parties. We're seeing that right now, right? President Biden is providing historic levels of federal investment. And meanwhile, Governor Ron DeSantis is also providing historic levels of, of state investment in Everglades restoration. Quality of the water crosses all boundaries, all, all parties, all interests. Um, it's something that is just, you know, so basic to us as humans. Besides being the largest and the most expensive, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan is also one of the most important. You know, the classic line, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas used to say it, is that the Everglades is a test. If we pass, we may get to keep the planet. It's essentially a test of our willingness to step back um, and say that it's not all about us. Reporting for UMTV, I'm Melanie Lowe. Restoring and preserving the Everglades is important not just for environmental, but also for economic reasons. The Florida economy is fueled by clean water, and that directly benefits the billions of dollars and the tens of thousands of jobs that are tied to tourism, recreation, fishing, boating, real estate, and other sectors of the economy. Ember Giles is here with a look at the economic benefits and drawbacks of the Everglades with a focus on one particular resource. 
Sophia, each year the Everglades ecosystem contributes billions of dollars to Florida's economy, but another type of economic activity down this 11 mile road here behind me in Big Cypress National Preserve has been at the center of a controversy for decades because of the past and future environmental impacts that it could have on the entire Everglades ecosystem. When tourists picture the Everglades, they see massive alligators soaking up the hot South Florida sun, or anhinga birds perched on top of a branch showing off their beautiful wings. But what many Floridians picture are big bags of cash. That's because each year the ecosystem generates billions of dollars for the state's economy and supports hundreds of thousands of jobs. A lot of Floridians make a living out of this, and, and we all are sustained by the Everglades, both from a natural resource perspective, the water that we drink, to the economy that makes our life here possible. One of the largest economic drivers is tourism. In 2021, Everglades National Park visitors spent over $150 million in communities that surround the park. Another sector of the economy that also relies on a healthy Everglades is the fishing industry. Each year, recreational fishing in the Everglades ecosystem generates an estimated $1.2 billion in economic output. The recreational fishing industry here in South Florida is larger than the agricultural industry from a revenue producing perspective. And more than two miles below some of the rivers and streams where these fish live lies one of the most lucrative natural resources on the planet, oil. But for decades, oil extraction and exploration in the Everglades has faced strong opposition for many. So our job is to make sure that we manage these activities to minimize the impact. Oil and gas is one of those activities that we have been engaging in uh, long before the National Park Service became the steward of Big Cypress National Preserve. Uh, and more than 80 years ago in 1941, the state of Florida supported and incentivized drilling for oil. The state passed the Oil Bonus Act, which promised to give $50,000 to the first company or individual who successfully drilled for oil in the state. They were offering a reward for the first company that managed to do any type of oil, successful oil extraction. So that, that kind of like was the start of the oil industry in, uh, in, you know, in Collier County and the Big Cypress Swamp area. And just two years later, the Humble Oil Company became the first to discover oil here in Sunderland, Florida, a town just a few miles north of Big Cypress National Preserve. And the Sunderland field will become one of the most productive oil fields in the history of the state. During its peak in 1977, the field would produce close to 14,000 barrels of oil per day. And during its lifetime, almost 19 million before it was eventually abandoned by ExxonMobil. Oil exploration in the Everglades took off. People from all across the country flocked to the Sunshine State to look for liquid gold. The next big discovery would probably be in 1972. It was a big Cypress oil field. And two years later in 1974, Washington and Tallahassee announced plans to buy more than 300,000 acres of private lands to create Big Cypress National Preserve. But the federal government wanted to save money, so they bought the rights to the land above the surface, but allowed sellers to maintain ownership of the minerals underneath the surface in the preserve. It was a lot cheaper just to buy the surface rights instead of the mineral rights because that would add you know, dollars to the cost. And as a result, the preserve hired a minerals management specialist to oversee all the oil extraction and exploration within the preserve. So what we do is that we work uh, closely with that private mineral owner to make sure that when they engage in activities to extract the mineral, that is compatible with the purpose of the preserve, which is to protect that natural essence, that natural value that it offers. Since the establishment of the preserve almost 50 years ago, many have called on leaders to end oil drilling in the Everglades once and for all. Local officials across South Florida strongly oppose new exploration because of how important the Everglades is to the economy. They're not looking at the big picture. They're looking at profits. What they're not looking at is the benefit of the, of the Everglades to all of the people that live here. It's just, uh, it's just crazy to, to think that, um, that, that such a risky proposition would take place in such um, uh, environmentally sensitive area, which is so vital um, to South Florida. Across the nation, oil drilling is an issue that divides politicians and political parties. But in Florida, ending drilling in the Everglades is one of the few issues that has strong bipartisan support.
Yet oil drilling at two legacy fields still produced just over 150,000 barrels of oil in 2022. For UMTV, I'm Ember Isles. The Everglades is truly one of the most unique and beautiful places in the world, uniting people from all walks of life to help save the area. But many environmentalists say there is still a lot more work to be done. We're taking a short break now, but when we come back, we will showcase some of the endangered species of the Everglades and highlight one animal that's nearly impossible to find. I think the panthers have a, have a, a, positive, a positive future here in Florida. News Vision will be right back. Thank you for staying with us on this special edition of UMTV's News Vision, celebrating the diamond jubilee of the Everglades National Park. Hundreds of animal and plant species that live here in the Everglades are considered endangered, threatened, or commercially exploited. Billy Brightman joins us now with more. Billy? The Everglades is one of the most critical ecosystems in the world, with a wide range of flora, fauna, and wildlife. Currently, more than 60 animals, like the alligators that live in this water here, and over 160 native seed-bearing plants are on the list of endangered or threatened species. The Florida Everglades is home to more than 1,500 animal and plant species. These include more than 360 species of birds, 300 species of both fresh and saltwater fish, some 50 reptile species, 40 mammal species, and about 750 native seed-bearing plants. And the Everglades is the only place in the United States where you can see some of these species in the wild. For example, the Everglades mink, the Florida panther, and the American crocodile. The Everglades is also the most important tropical wading bird breeding ground in North America. The park provides critical foraging and breeding habitat for 16 species of wading birds, such as egrets, herons, and ibises. Everglades National Park was the first national park that was officially protected for biodiversity and not just scenery. But over the past century, the ecosystem has lost more than 90% of its wading bird population and dozens of Everglades species are considered endangered and threatened. The Everglades has been protected for so long uh, and it, during, during that entire time, it has been the safest harbor for some of the most endangered species that we have, not only in Florida, but in North America. Some of the animals on the endangered species list are the Florida panther, which is the largest and most endangered mammal in North America, American alligator and American crocodile, manatee, snail kite, wood stork, various turtles and tortoises, and Florida bonneted bat. And some of the plants on the endangered list are Florida prairie clover, Florida bristol fern, Everglades bully, and Cape sable thoroughwort. One of the main threats to the Everglades species is urbanization and agricultural development, which has resulted in serious habitat loss, something that authorities are trying to undo. The work that we do uh, as stewards of these places, particularly when it comes to endangered species, is it, it, mostly habitat work. Our philosophy is that when you create a good habitat, whether marine or terrestrial, it, all the species, not, not just the ones that are threatened and endangered, are going to have the best chance at survival. Invasive species are another serious threat to the native flora and fauna of the Everglades. About 1.7 million acres of the Everglades have been invaded by non-native plants. One of the biggest threats is an Australian swamp tree called Melaleuca, it was planted in the Everglades in 1905, when efforts to drain the ecosystem were in full swing. Melaleuca literally sucks the wet out of wetlands. Now there are tens of thousands of acres of Melaleuca in the Everglades, and they're this disastrous invasive species. We're spending tens of millions of dollars to try to get rid of it, and it just doesn't like to die. So how do we solve this problem? It all goes back to restoration efforts we're going to continue investing our resources so that if we cannot ever eradicate these things, we cannot throw in the towel. We need to continue applying pressure just so that we can give the native 
environment the best chance possible to do well by itself. And one of the most endangered species, not just in the Everglades, but in the world, is the Florida panther. Ryan Marshall has been trying to track down some panthers for weeks. Ryan, why is it so hard? Billy, this is a sign that visitors to the Everglades will see on the roads inside the park. It warns them to beware of crossing panthers, but it would actually be a miracle if anyone were to see a panther in the wild, because currently there are about only 200 of them left. Hidden in the Everglades and Big Cypress National Preserve is the remaining population of Florida's big cat. The Florida panther once roamed across the entire southeastern United States, but the panther's habitat has been destroyed through urban development and is now only a small fraction located in southern Florida. And over the last couple hundred years, the apex predator's population decreased to around 20 individuals left in the wild in the 1970s. The small population and limited gene pool forced biologists and conservationists to take some extreme measures to ensure the species' survival. And we made the very difficult decision to bring in six female Texas cougars. We released them in the wild. We let them breed one time, and then we removed them. And while these efforts have helped raise the population to around 200 wild Florida panthers, the species is still considered one of the most endangered mammals in North America. They're so saturated in the existing preserved lands now, and they've got pressures coming, like I said, from development on all sides they need to move northward, and they need to be able to move northward safely into other areas, other large forest tracts and preserves. As development in Florida has boomed over the last 50 years, the urban sprawl has led to small side roads being built through Florida Panther territory. And as a result, road collisions are the number one cause of death for Florida's big cat. It's basically the areas around Naples continuing to expand eastward. And as these small roads that used to not get much traffic when they build more and more housing developments, all of a sudden they have a lot of traffic on them and you have panthers that are growing in numbers and they're moving that way too. And those areas where those roads overlap, they have no protections to keep panthers from running out onto the road like I-75 does. For decades, the Florida panther breeding range has been limited to south of the Caloosahatchee River, leading to saturated territories. But in 2020, the first female panther and her kittens were seen north of the river. Biologists and conservationists have proposed a plan to allow more panthers and other endangered wildlife to safely move north of the river through the use of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, a web of private and public connected lands across the state that secures access for roaming wildlife. That corridor is what enables animals to, to, to travel throughout the state uninterrupted. And we're working with all kinds of people, Florida ranchers, cattle ranchers, you know, agricultural people to maintain that corridor. People think about the ranchers and the agricultural people as kind of like the enemies of conservation. In reality, they're not. They're providing huge conservation easements that allow these animals from the Florida panther to deer to bear to be able to move up and down the state. And many of these ranchers are strong supporters of the corridor and the protection of Florida's wildlife. It's not all about the panther. It's about where the panther lived. If we save the panther, we have to save his habitat. But some ranchers believe they are not being paid enough compensation in cases where panthers prey on cattle and other livestock. We can't just save the panther and forget all the people that are gonna sustain that food supply for that panther. The Florida Wildlife Corridor Act was signed in 2021 and an expansion to the bill has been approved in 2023. And biologists and conservationists hope the corridor might be the solution in saving the Florida panthers. If we can get these ranchers to understand, we get these panthers to start migrating north of Caloosahatchee and that panther range extends, I think the panthers have a, have a, a, positive, a positive future here in Florida. For UMTV, I'm Ryan Marshall. Besides hundreds of native species who live in the Everglades, the park is also home to many invasive species, including plants such as Brazilian pepper and Australian pine, and animals such as tegu lizards, wild boars, and lionfish, among others. They all pose a significant threat to the ecosystem by taking over it and driving native species out of existence. And without a doubt, the worst invasive animal in the Everglades is the Burmese python. Jaira Rivero joins us now with more. Jaira? 
Guys, the Burmese python is indeed the biggest threat to the native species here in the Everglades. Nobody knows how many of these constrictive snakes live in the area, but estimates say it's in the hundreds of thousands. The pythons can grow very large, some up to 20 feet, and they don't have any natural predators. So it is up to humans to try and rid the Everglades of these invasive snakes. The, the python is a very charismatic, it is a beautiful animal, but it doesn't belong here. The Burmese python is native to parts of Asia and it was introduced to Florida in the late 1980s when people started importing exotic pets. But when the pet snakes grew too big for their owners, many were dumped into the Everglades. People did not understand that when a, an exotic animal a, gets loose in a natural environment, it could in fact uh, survive. And if it survives and then it thrives, then it could take over the landscape and displace the, the natural uh, flora and fauna that exists. With no natural predators, the snakes are multiplying and eating everything they can. The National Academies of, Academy of Science uh, basically indicted the python for being responsible for the collapse of the small mammal population. These aren't captive bred snakes that are eating once a month or once every two months. They'll eat any chance they can get. Nobody knows exactly how many Burmese pythons live in the Everglades, but some estimates put their numbers as high as half a million. Each female snake can lay up to 100 eggs every year, and these snakes can live an average of 20 years. It's a problem that has been uh, testing us now for several decades, and it's also a problem that has been very, very difficult to, to get our arms around. The state of Florida has implemented several different initiatives to rid the Everglades of Burmese pythons. One of those is a competition called the Annual Python Challenge, which brings hunters from all over the United States to the Everglades to find and catch as many of these snakes as possible. But while the competition certainly raises awareness for the issue, the participants manage to catch just a few dozen snakes at a time. So officials are also calling in on the public to help with the python eradication by using an app called I've Got One. It allows you to take a picture Mark the location with a GPS, just dropping a pin and letting us know where you removed the snake from. The most successful initiative to catch Burmese pythons to date is the hiring of 100 contractors whose sole job is to hunt and kill the snakes. Yeah, so we get paid um, minimum wage and then we get paid per snake. So the first four feet of the snake is $50 and then every additional foot after that is $25 and uh, we're basically hunting the hunters. We're, we're, going out after, uh, we're going after them when they're moving. They're looking for food and we're looking for them. Since the contractor program began in 2017, hunters like Ryan and Donna have removed about 10,000 pythons from the Everglades. But while that might sound promising, the consensus is that the Everglades would never be completely free of Burmese pythons. My scientists are telling me that uh, they're not feeling all that optimistic but that doesn't mean giving up on getting rid of the most invasive species in the Florida Everglades. We're not going to throw in the towel and we're going to continue investing in science. We're going to continue putting the pressure on the species uh, by collecting it when we can and, 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 and partnering with uh, other agencies, other entities, and even uh, Floridians. For UMTV, I'm Jay Rivero. Sophia, what do you think? Me, you, go python hunting, make some extra money? Oh, uh, you're on your own with that one, Daryl, but rest assured, there are other ways we can get involved in saving the Everglades. But first, we will take you on a trip along Tamiami Trail to visit one unusual place. And we will examine how a closure of an airport in the park led to the creation of one of the largest preserves in the Everglades. The jetport is actually what crystallized the movement that resulted in the creation of Big Cypress National Preserve. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Anytime you drive through the Everglades, you are bound to see or hear an airboat tour, or five. <laughs> Airboats first came to Florida in the 1930s, allowing people to go deeper into the river of grass. But did this revolutionary invention actually cause more harm than good to the Everglades? Ainsley Better explores that answer. 
Ainsley? There are three authorized airboat businesses in the Everglades, and Gator Park here is one of them. The airboat industry has been around for close to 100 years and has been established as a popular tourist attraction in the park, and business is booming. But noise pollution and habitat destruction raises red flags for many, and for years it's been debated whether these tours should be allowed to keep running. If you want to explore the heart of the Everglades, the only way to do it is on an airboat. Airboats have been a staple of tourism in the Everglades for more than 90 years, allowing people to get close to wildlife with nothing but sawgrass marshes in sight. Just being able to get to areas that you'd never be able to get a chance to walk through or take a look at unless you're in a plane. Since the Everglades are just a few feet deep, a regular boat with a submerged propeller cannot run here. An airboat bottom is flat and the motor is located outside of the water, which allows the boats to float on the surface. Uh, it is a way that uh, people many, many years ago uh, discovered in order to get into the environment down here, which is really difficult to get into. But despite their benefits to tourists and the economy, airboats have their negative sides. Dozens of accidents involving airboats happen every year for various reasons. I would say sometimes it's operator inexperience or improper lookout that causes some of these accidents. Um, BUI is sometimes a, a factor boating under the influence of alcohol. Airboat operators are also required to instruct passengers on how to stay safe. You're a lot safer sitting down than trying to stand up because these boats do not have brakes and they are sliding on top of the water in the grass. To protect the fragile ecosystem, airboats are allowed to take only certain routes through the Everglades. It's, it's really up to the operator to understand the hydrologic conditions of the marsh at the time and, and realize whether they can and can't really proceed. And then we do have some pretty strict rules as to what the water levels are that we can go out in. But despite the cons, airboats remain one of the most popular tourist attractions in the Everglades for almost 100 years. And our job as stewards of these places is to make sure that we find that sweet spot between conservation and use. I think it's, it's an important research tool. Um, and if we want to protect the Everglades, if we want to make people aware of the Everglades, I don't think of, of a better tool. For UMTV, I'm Ainsley Vetter. When you drive down the Tamiami Trail through the park, you might see a sign pointing to an airport. Over 50 years ago, the Miami-Dade Port Authority announced a plan to build an airport in the heart of the Everglades. And although their plan was never complete, a two-mile-long runway was. Along with a control center nearby, ready to welcome cargo and passengers, leaving 40 square miles of land in the Everglades destroyed forever. Anna Kuhn dug into the history of the airport and is at the Dade Collier Airport with more. Anna, what did you find out? Behind this gate is what was supposed to be the biggest airport in the world. It was envisioned back in the late 1960s as a massive global hub with multiple runways that would welcome supersonic passenger planes from all over the world, right here in the middle of the Everglades. But that never happened, and today it's known as the greatest airport that never was. Hold up in the swamps of the Everglades lies a ghost of a dream that never came to be. Construction for the Dade Collier Airport started in 1968, and it was Florida's plan to take off into the future. Somebody even back then realized what was going to happen today, which was we were going to have millions of people move into the area. And with a big population came a need for big air travel and cargo centers. And Miami-Dade Port Authority thought the perfect place for it was in the swamps just outside Everglades National Park. It would mean the Dade County would be the first in solving the big problems that we have today in urban and mass transportation. And at the same time, the Boeing company was building a supersonic passenger plane, the Boeing 2707. With the takeoff blast so loud, it was said that it could shatter windows within a five mile radius of the plane. Anything you're going to build, you're going to have to build far away. And in 1969, the spot was decided. And all the way from the White House, President Richard Nixon pressed his big red button to send the first blast of dynamite, beginning airport construction six miles north of Everglades National Park. And with that, 
explosion began the reawakening of a movement that kind of had gone dormant, the birth of the new environmental movement in South Florida. Just two years later, in 1971, the Boeing 2707 project was killed and the plane never made a commercial flight. But the 2707's fail to lift off wasn't the real reason for the airport's failure. Uh, if you build this jet port, it's going to kill this national treasure. Conservationists realized a massive airport would lead to a lot more. The Department of Transportation was dreaming up plans for massive highways across the state and metro rails coming in from Tampa and Miami to bring passengers, which is where Everglades activist Marjorie Stoneman Douglas came into action. The jet port is the beginning of the next 50 years of her life, you know, and, and fighting these fights and creating the Friends of the Everglades. Friends of the Everglades is now a massive conservation group that works on all sorts of restoration projects. But back in the 60s, its first and only goal was to take on the Port Authority and shut down the Everglades jet port. They were openly hostile to people like Ms. Douglas and Art and me. You're not ready to say at this time that the commercial airport in the Everglades will not be built. I am not, no sir, you better believe it. But eventually, he came around. And it was in major part to a man named Nathaniel Reed. Reed was the Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at the Department of Interior. And his team created this, the environmental impact of the Big Cypress Swamp jet port. Richard Nixon, the president, he didn't give a damn about the environment. But Nat Reed, he was able to change their minds. Once the federal government pulled their support from the project, the Miami Port Authority stopped construction. But left behind was a massive runway in the middle of the swamp and a reminder that this land was in danger. The jet port is actually what crystallized the movement that resulted in the creation of Big Cypress National Preserve. The Cypress National Preserve is 729,000 acres of land that surround the airport on all sides, and it holds the major watersheds that provide water to the entire national park. The death of the jet port brought on competing mindsets. Environmentalists wanted to make the land an extension of Everglades National Park. But the people that lived there, like hunters, fishers, and native tribes, protested. They were living on Big Cypress because they had gotten kicked off the land in Everglades National Park in 1947. And they wanted to protect the land, but also keep their homes and businesses. So the groups came up with a big compromise. It wasn't going to be a park. It was a new breed of cat. It was going to be called a preserve. Naming the land a preserve meant residents already living there could keep their homes, and Miccosukee and Seminole tribes could continue to use the land as they always did. Plus, sportsmen could still make a living off the woods and water by leading fishing or eco-tours. But the land was protected from any commercial development. Today, the jet port still stands, but it doesn't look like much. It's just this one building, essentially an office with a couple radios, a small staff, and a window that overlooks the runway. No fueling, maintenance, or FAA control tower. This is just purely touch and goes up front. The airport works mostly as a training facility for new pilots and only sees a few planes a day. It's funny that it sits there quiet, but boy did it make a big boom and, and jumpstart a lot of things. And now, conservationists say its biggest use is as a symbol, a slab of pavement that serves as a reminder that this land is meant to be protected. Anna Kuhn, UMTV. And when you continue along the Tamiami Trail, you may notice another building that seems desolate. But this tiny shed has actually been home to a functioning business for more than 70 years. Harvey Duplock is in Ochopee, Florida, with more. It seems everything in the Everglades is enormous. The swamp, the alligators, the pythons. But there is one place in the heart of the Everglades National Park that is actually the tiniest of its kind. Uh, this is the smallest post office in the United States. In the world, actually, Guinness says they can't find a smaller one anywhere, so... Don Walters has been the postmaster of the Achopi Post Office for five and a half years. He is responsible for collecting and sorting mail for the Everglades National Park and the Miccosukee Native American Reservation. But luckily for Don, a mail carrier is responsible for delivering the mail along a 135-mile route. Uh, we deliver a couple hundred pieces of 100 parcels a day. But while Don has only been a Choppy's postmaster for a few years, this post office has been here for many decades. 
The original post office used to be in this area, just a half mile west of the current post office. It was founded in 1932 by the father of the Tamiami Trail, James Franklin Jordan. It was a part of the Gaunt Tomato Company General Store. But in 1953, just like most of the original town, it burnt down. And so the Gaunt Company stepped in and saved the day. They said, move into our pump shed temporarily while we build a new uh, general store. New general store never got built because the federal government came in and took over everything. And so the post office has been here temporarily now for 70 years. And although working in a shed with lizards and snakes might not be everyone's cup of tea, it certainly is Don's. Oh, I love this job. It's the best job in the post office, hands down. For UMTV, I'm Harvey Duplock. The Everglades has been around for thousands of years and its benefits to Florida and the world are indisputable. As you've heard today, people almost managed to kill this ecosystem. But now that we've realized how important these wetlands are, we're doing everything we can to restore and save them for generations to come. This place is not the majestic mountains that you see out west, uh, like in Yosemite or the canyon of the Grand Canyon. This place is more about the little details. And I love that about it, because when you get to know how those little details function with each other, it really is a fascinating place that I just don't get tired of. To have it all in this weird river of grass that most people come and look at and think like, you know, what's the big deal here? It's just sawgrass and water. You know, the whole package is real, really kind of cool. We're world recognized for the Everglades National Park. If we don't preserve those special things that make Florida special and the wildlife that goes with it, then uh, none of us are going to benefit in the end. If you build it, they will come, right? So if we invest and we continue to make these efforts into restoring the Everglades, the birds, the wildlife, the hydrology will be restored. We're not on some little island that doesn't affect everything else. We're all connected. And the more people realize that and they act like that, the more that they can help. It's really, really important that we all collectively row the boat in the same direction. The more connected you are to nature and to the Everglades, the more you'll care about it. You know, get outside, go for a bird walk, um, explore Everglades National Park. The last century of the Everglades was sort of this development story that was all about us. I think maybe the, the next century is going to be our efforts to see if we can make something not just about us. Stay informed, stay involved. The Everglades can't speak for itself and we need folks speaking for it. Thinking of the environments, the animals, and people, and supporting all of it, no one effort on their own can be successful. And so I just encourage people to really think about that in their daily life if they can. I think with proper management, this ecosystem is going to be around a long time. Nature is very adaptable and it tends to really take care of its own and survive and come back. There's a commitment from FWC to really make sure that this ecosystem is around for many years to come. The future of the Everglades looks really bright. I'm confident that if we continue to make this progress, we'll start to see more and more returns on our investment. I am 100% confident that we will achieve Everglades restoration. We are well on our way to make sure that the ecosystem is rehydrated. And so my hope is that the next generation will have an environment that is restored, that is thriving, and that will continue to provide the opportunity to enjoy all of what living in Florida means to us today. Well, we are having a lot of fun here at the Anhinga Trail, but our time together celebrating the 75th anniversary of one of the most important and fascinating places in the world, the Florida Everglades, has come to an end. As you've seen today, this magnificent park is truly a national and global treasure, and it's our responsibility to ensure that it's around for generations to come. But that's only possible if people come together and help save this unique place. That combined with the ongoing restoration efforts and the power of Mother Nature will allow this national park to shape the legacy of South Florida. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful journey through the Florida Everglades. We truly hope you enjoyed this culmination of months of work and research combined with nearly 5,000 years of history. Thank you and stay safe.